Like, this is the point where everybody was like, hey, we can't do this. And so I said, all right, let's change gears and let's do this non flip. And so I stopped making videos. Oh, so these are not from my like class? Oh, these are. I'm, I'm saying like the videos. You are watching. Oh, the, oh so it should have. 20th. Oh. Yeah, I know I uploaded it. Maybe I didn't. Like, so I have to upload it and then I have to put it in the correct playlist. Maybe I put it in the wrong playlist. Would you send me an email and say, would you check on the October 20th Zoom class? Yeah, I'll let, I'll let. And I must have, because I know I uploaded it. I must have put it, maybe I'll put it in like my 109 class or something like that. Okay. And if it is, it's going to freak my 109 class. They're going to watch it. <laughs> I'm like, what are you Just talking about? <laughs> Yeah, so that thank you. Send me the email and I will I will track it down one way or another. Okay, how much time we got? What time is it? One minute. One minute. All right, let's see. So that was that counts as a joke. That counts as one. Uh -huh. Let's see. <laughs> what? Like I said, I will say you You'll say you'll okay, so I'll do one and you got one? Okay. So what do you call a female magician in the desert? A sandwich. A sandwich. And I told my I told my first joke earlier, and the people in the front heard it. Y'all want to hear it too? All right. So uh did y'all hear about the guy who lost his entire left side? He's all right. He's all right. <laughs> all right. You want to share one? All right. Tell those dad jokes. <laughs> <laughs> what do you call a fish with a bow tie? It's a fish cage. <laughs> That's nice. It's very nice. Very nice. You got one? All right. What do you call a fish with no eye? I don't know. What do you call a fish with no eyes? <laughs> That's good. I'm gonna have to share that. That's good. That's good. Y'all, y'all are stepping up my game. I like it. All right. So, <laughs> so the last class. What kind? What class of molecules did we kind of talk about? What does hemoglobin fit into? Globular soluble protein. So protein that is either outside or inside the cell, but it is soluble in like the cytoplasm or soluble in the extracellular matrix or something like that. That's what um, hemoglobin was an example of. 
So now we're gonna change gears and we're gonna talk about proteins that are embedded in the membrane. So there are three major classes of proteins. The first time I write on the board, I always forget to pick a pen of uh, proteins embedded in the membrane. Okay, so there are three different kinds. There are uh, membrane receptor proteins. So membrane receptor proteins, we're not really gonna talk about so much in this one, that is gonna be chapter eight. We will talk about them in great detail in chapter eight. There are membrane bound proteins that act as metabolic enzymes. And a lot of times they're embedded kind of in a row like we've talked about before, whereas you can deplete um, one product and drive the next reaction, right? And so we talked about that really in chapters, um, I think that is 11 and 12, right? Because really 11 is the electron transport chain and um, photosynthesis is 12. And so both times we're really talking about ATP production. And so these membrane bound uh, metabolic enzymes um, are all about doing oxidation reduction reactions. Reduction reactions in order to drive ATP synthesis. So we'll talk about them later. I don't know how far we'll get, we'll see. The last one, which is what we are gonna focus on today are membrane transport proteins. These are the ones that are gonna facilitate movement of molecules that don't naturally cross the membrane on their own. So you, you have to remember that the reason why we're selecting these individual proteins, right? Like why do we focus on one in particular? It's because we're trying to illustrate the, the principle of complementarity where our structure drives our function. So that's kind of what biochemistry is all about, right? How the structure of something is gonna drive what it can do. So biomolecules in general can cross our membrane in one of two ways. Either we are hydrophobic and we diffuse straight across the lipid bilayer, but you can only do that if you're going down a concentration gradient, right? So if you wanna get into the cell, you have to have high concentration outside, low concentration inside, and then you'll be able to diffuse across. So give me some examples. What are some small molecules that can diffuse across the membrane? Oxygen. Oxygen's one. Carbon dioxide too. If you talk about oxygen, you gotta talk about carbon dioxide, right? Because we need oxygen to, to live, but we're also gonna make carbon dioxide as waste. So they both have to be exchangeable. What else? Sugars we need to transport in. Sugars we need to transport in. Steroids are a great example of things because steroids bind to what? A lot of times, not always, a lot of times. The transcription factors that are in the nucleus, right? So we have to get across membranes in order to do that. So they're just gonna diffuse across. But things that are polar are actually going to have to be transported, right? because they're trying to get through those layers of those nonpolar fatty acid tails. And that's not gonna happen. They have to be, those polar parts of those mm -hmm. molecules have to be shielded so that they can get through those nonpolar fatty acid tails, right? Okay, so. Okay. So there are two types, there are two major classifications for our membrane transport proteins. There are ones that will do it passively which means that it's always going to go down the concentration gradient. If it is passive, it will go down the concentration gradient. And that does not require energy, right? That is, that is built on the, the, the principle of diffusion. Active on the other hand, yes, sir? Oh, somebody else must have it up high. Thank you. Always tell me, please tell me. Okay, so, so passive is always gonna go down our concentration gradient, dependent upon um, diffusion. Active, on the other hand, can go against our concentration gradient. And this is so important for lots and lots of different um, processes inside the cell. And we're gonna talk about quite a few of them today. 
So this is one way that you can classify them. And your book talks about another way that you classify them. And so I kind of want to talk about the other way that your book classifies them. Your book also can classify them as carriers or as channels, right? So a carrier is always, always, always going to be active, always, right? So a carrier is something that is going to physically attach to our, our, our transport molecules, our molecules that we want to get from one place to another. They're physically going to associate with them and carry them across the membrane. So that is going to be an active form of transport. Channels, on the other hand, can be either one. These can be passive or they can be active. It really, really depends. So when we talk about carriers, if you're actually going to associate with a molecule, do you think you can associate with a wide range of molecules or a small range of molecules? A small, right? Because that's a physical interaction that has to occur. So you have to have residues that will actually interact with whatever charge or whatever it is, right? So carriers, um, have very high specificity. That's how we say that in biochemistry terms, right? High specificity. But if you're going to have such high specificity and you actually physically have to carry the molecules, do you think that's going to happen very quickly or slowly? slowly. It's going to happen slowly. So you might have this massive concentration gradient but you can only move so many at a time. So there are gonna be limits to what a carrier can do. Whereas a channel, on the other hand, a channel is going to be um, much more, much lower specificity. So lower specificity. Right, some, some channels are specific, but in general, most of them are pretty general. They let most things go through that are charged or most things that are something in particular. But the other thing that's really great about channels is that they go really fast. You can really, really quickly go, go across your, your concentration gradient. So let's, let's look at some examples of these. So if we look at the first, this is simple diffusion, right? So passive or active passive, right? Simple diffusion. It's going to be completely dependent upon your concentration gradient. So here's a graph of simple passive diffusion. So we're graphing the ability of our molecules to cross the membrane versus concentration of solute. So the more solute you have, what happens to your rate? The higher the rate, right? That makes sense because there's nothing limiting how quickly that molecule can cross the membrane. Okay, what if we have facilitated diffusion down a concentration gradient? So what's an example of that? A channel, right? We have this open channel. Think about it like a tunnel, right? The tunnel is always open. It, it doesn't have to, there's no doors, there's no, it's just open, right? And we're gonna let things flow through it. So what's going to happen as we increase solute concentration? As long as the channel is big enough, right, the more solute we have, the quicker it's going to go through the tunnel, the channel, right? Okay, now here's where, here's where that, that channel and carrier become important. You can still have facilitated diffusion, but in this case, we're going to do it with a carrier protein. So this carrier protein actually has to physically associate with the molecules, deassociate, and then go again, right? It has to happen over and over again. So as we get to a maximal solute concentration, what happens to our translocation rate? It starts dropping, right? Because there's a maximum amount that this carrier can handle. So it doesn't matter how big the concentration gets on one side of the membrane, there's a maximal rate that's dependent upon this, this uh, carrier protein associating with the molecules and bringing them in, associating with the molecules, bringing them in, right? That's, 
that's your rate limiting step. Whereas in the other ones, your rate limiting step was your concentration of your solute. How exactly would a carrier work for passive if it's only, like we said before, if it's only able to work through active? It's there not. There is a mechanism. We're going to talk about it today. We're going to talk about in detail today. So we're gonna, I'm going to pull up different examples of each one and how they work. So absolutely. Okay. So then you can have active transport through a carrier, right? This one was facilitated diffusion. So you didn't have to have energy in order to make it happen. But here we're having active transport where we're actually pulling molecules against the concentration gradient. So in this case, where the same thing's gonna happen, there's a maximal amount of ions per time or, or molecules per time that this, that this transporter, that this carrier can actually move. So even if you put it to where you had more molecules so that you're actually facilitating diffusion, it wouldn't matter because your, your carrier protein can only handle so much. So if you are a carrier, right, you're limited by the design of the protein. Whereas if you're a channel, you're limited by the concentration of the solute, right? So if you look up here, here's an example of a facilitated diffusion. So we have molecules that are going down their concentration gradient. I have a lot more red up here than I have down here. So they're going to go through diffusion, right? So this is our form of passive transport. Whereas over here in this green, this is one protein in one conformation, and this is the same protein in a different conformation. So do you notice that you have lots of green particles on this side of the membrane and fewer down here? So in order to move these green particles to areas of higher concentration, I'm gonna have to drive that with energy. The way that I drive that is that these green molecules can associate with this transporter molecule. And that's great, right? This is one way. They associate, that's great, but I wanna send them down here. So I bind, and then when I hydrolyze ATP, I can use that energy to undergo a conformational change and release those molecules to the other side of the membrane. So ones that require ATP are going to induce some kind of conformational change, right? And that requires energy. That's why they're their energy consuming reactions. So the question is, how do I know? How do I know something is gonna require energy or not to be transported? And so you can use this formula to calculate delta G because if I don't need energy, what's my delta G value gonna be? It's gonna be negative. It's gonna happen spontaneously on its own. We don't have to drive it by coupling it to ATP hydrolysis. So, so let's do an example. Let's do an example. I'm gonna transport sugar. Okay, that's, that's, this is my example. I have a sugar transporter and I'm gonna have um, an, an extracellular, extracellular concentration that is equal to 100 times my intracellular concentration, right? And I wanna know is this going to happen spontaneously or not? What's sugar's electrical charge? Is it charged? No, it's polar, but it's not charged. So it has an electrical charge of zero, right? Um, what, let's see, what else do we need? We need temperature. What else? What do we know about temperature? If we're transporting sugar inside the body, what temperature are we? We're 37 degrees Celsius, but do we do any math in Celsius? No, we really like to do our math in what? Kelvin. So what is that in Kelvin? 310. Okay, we also need, you know, y'all know what F is? Faraday's constant. So you need Faraday's constant. You don't have to memorize Faraday's constant. If I if I need you to use it, I'll give it to you. Kilojoules per volt mole. Volt mole. That's an F. Okay. All right. So what R do we want to use? 
So 8.314 kilojoules per mole. Okay, per mole K. All right, uh, let's see. And then we need concentration one, concentration two. So concentration one is basically where the molecule is that you wanna transport it. And then concentration two is what's that concentration at its destination, right? So two is destination. And then one is the starting point. So let's plug this stuff in, right? So this is charge, this is charge. This one's Faraday's constant, right? C is concentration. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. That's membrane potential. This is charge. charge. So if we know that our charge is zero, what's going to happen to this whole thing? That's going to equal to zero. So let's come down here and let's write delta G R T L N C two over C one, right? Plus, and it's going to be zero because we have this here. All right, so plug in your different, plug in the rest. What is R? 8.314 kilojoules per mole K. Temperature is, what do we say, 310 Kelvin, LN of, now what do I put for C1 and C2? I just told you it was 100X. The units cancel, so do I really need units? No, not really. I just need the ratio. So what's my ratio? I want to move the sugar into the cell. If I want to move it into the cell, what was the concentration starting with? So I have, because I have a lot outside, right? I've just eaten my meal. I have high blood sugar. So my concentration, my C1 is 100. What's my C2? One. And it all depends. You have to know, am I moving the sugar into the cell or out of the cell? And then you have that ratio, right? Okay. Anybody have a calculator? Yeah. Extracellular is 100 times the intracellular. I read that as the intracellular is 100. So it's no, no. Well, right. Okay. So anybody have a calculator? What do we get? I think I turned my chat on today. Put my chat on. We're going to do one more example. So if you have a calculator, it'd be good to have. So what do y'all get? 11.869 kilojoules per mole. So sig figs, what I, I really only gave you one sig fig. So let's give me to two, it'd be 12, right? Terrible of me, one sig fig, that's horrible. All right, so spontaneous or not? Yes, it's spontaneous. So are we going to have active transport or passive transport? Is the, is the LN? LN is not. It's 11,869 11, joules. Or kilo, what are you giving it? It's kilojoules. kilojoules. So you get 11 or you get 11,000? 11, okay, 11,000. So we'll make that a comma. Thousand. Because that is kilojoules. So that, no, it's in, it's in kilojoules per mole. You cancel out the case. Your case cancel. You you have kilojoules. 
As long as R is in kilojoules, you have kilojoules. Yeah, it's 12,000. Y'all get 12,000? That doesn't feel right. Which guy? No. Which guy? Oh, wait, no, it's 8.314 joules. Is it joules? Okay, then there you go, joules. Okay, so then kilojoules, so that would be joules, so then this would be kilojoules. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. There you go. There we go. So this one should be joules. There you go. We well, yeah, have kilojoules. I was wondering, like, I was okay. like, so we have so we have negative 12. So we have passive or active transport. Passive. Does this make sense? Yes. How often is your blood sugar going to rise and you're going to need to take blood into your cells? Right? Pretty regular every time you eat a meal. So you don't want that to require energy because what you're what are you doing with that sugar once you get it in? Right. You're trying to use it to make energy. So you don't want it to require energy to get it into the cell. So you have to think about things like that, about what you're actually requiring energy for. Um, right, exactly, exactly. Um, so the other one I wanna talk about is, let's say we're, we wanna move against a concentration gradient. That's moving with a concentration gradient. Do you remember what I talked about before about what goes against a concentration gradient? Calcium, we were talking about calcium, active transport of calcium. So inside of all of our muscles, right, in order to make muscles contract, it's all dependent upon calcium concentrations. So we'll talk about muscle contraction. Let's see, muscle contraction. When we have muscle contractions happening, um, we actually want to move, like we've had our muscles contract and we want to make them relax. So in order to do that, you have to add calcium and remove calcium from the cytosol. So you're your muscle cells have something called a sarcoplasmic reticulum. Reticulum. And the sarcoplasmic reticulum is basically a vacuole that will hold calcium. A ton, a ton of calcium. The sarcoplasmic reticulum typically has 1.5 millimolar calcium. Okay. Now, once muscle contraction is kind of done, you have about, in the cytosol, you have about 0 0.1 micromolar calcium. That is millimolar and micromolar. So let's put them in the same units. What is, what is our sarcoplasmic reticulum concentration in micromolar? 1,500 micromolar in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And I want to move, I want to move, oh, like when you put it certain places, it doesn't like it. Okay, I wanna move calcium from cytosol to sarcoplasmic reticulum. Am I going up or down the concentration gradient? I'm going way up it, right? Okay, so my question is, is that going to be something that's going to require energy or not? More than likely, yes. So let's prove it. Let's prove it. Yes, logically, it's going to require energy. Let's prove it. So our calcium, what's our calcium concentration? Our calcium concentration, our calcium ion uh, charge. Plus two, right? Okay. Faraday's constant is still going to be a constant. Um, what else we got? We got R is still going to be a constant. What's our temperature? Our temperature is still going to be 310 Kelvin. The other thing that we need to worry about is, see if I go up, is our membrane potential. This right here is membrane potential. So our membrane potential is the, the difference in charge on one side of a membrane than the other, and not all cells have it. But in this case, our cells do have it. And so these have a membrane potential. Let me come down here. Um, we have a membrane potential of 50 millivolts. And so Faraday's constant, let's go back up. Where's Faraday's constant? Did I give you all Faraday's constant? Yes. 
those per volt moles. So we need to be in volt, not in millivolts. So let's convert this to volts. 0 0.050 volts, right? Yeah, okay. So let's plug it in and let's do this problem. So plug it into your formula, delta G is equal to RT ln C2 over C1 plus CF delta B, right? Okay, that's a G. All right, so what do we get? Delta G, what is R? 8.314. Now, do we want to be in joules or kilojoules? We want to be in kilojoules, so let's just do it times 10 to the minus three. Then we can be in kilojoules. Get that over with. Mole K. Temperature is? 310 Kelvin, so our Kelvins cancel. LN, what, what are our concentrations? Where C1 is what we want to be, that's on the bottom. That's where we are to start with. 0.1 micromolar, just make sure your units cancel. And then where we're going is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is 1500 micromolar. Okay. Now, what's our charge on our calcium? Plus two. Faraday's constant I gave y'all was 96.5. I'm so running out of room. Kilojoules, because that's why we converted here to kilojoules, right? Per volt, per volt mole. And then what do we have to squeeze in? also times our membrane potential. All right, so what do we get? Should have started more to the left. <laughs> Anybody? Should get something positive. Okay. 34.4, then we'll be at kilojoules. That shouldn't be, it should just be volt, right? Not volt mole, because you get it in kilojoules per mole. No, it is volt mole. It is volt mole. I was like, it will cancel. No, it won't cancel. It's an addition in there. So is it, does it require energy? Yes, and does that make sense? Yes, it's gonna require energy for you to make your muscles contract. That's one of the primary reasons why we need to consume things in order to have energy for muscle contraction. So think about your answers. Like in the question, think about your answer. Does it make sense? It should make sense. All right. So that's kind of how you can determine, are you gonna go through passive? Are you gonna go through active transport? And when we talk about that, you also need to think about if you're going to go through passive or active transport, those two molecules are going to look very different. Can you say what the delta G was? Delta G? No, B. What does that stand for? Oh, our membrane potential. Okay. Okay. Membrane so potential. B instead of, uh, oh, yeah. Either way works. Either <laughs> way works. So you have to worry about structure, right? If you have something that's going to be passive, it's going to look very different than something that's going to be active. So we're going to look at structures of passive transport mechanisms, and then we're going to look at structures of active. So if you have something that is, for example, a porin, we talked about aquaporins, right? What goes through aquaporins? Water. 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 So um, porins tend to have beta barrels. So remember the beta barrels? are those beta sheets that are lined up kind of at an angle and make that circle. So GFP has a beta barrel, aquaporins have a beta barrel. And so what's happening is you have this big space in the middle that allows for ions to pass through them. Um, so a lot of times what you'll see in there is that those beta sheets, so one beta sheet will have residues that will face into the barrel and one beta sheet will have residues that face out into the membrane. 
because you have to remember that that all of these integral membrane proteins have to have parts of the molecule that interact with what has to pass through them and has to be able to interact with the nonpolar fatty acid tails right so the side chains that are facing inward towards the 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 center column what kind of residues do you think those are going to be well if we're typically transporting polar things through the membrane right those are the things that don't want to diffuse across so you want what kind of residues facing inward polar what kind of residues do you want facing outward nonpolar and that's exactly what you see one beta strand will be polar side chains facing in the next beta strand will be non-polar side chains facing out and it's a really great design because it integrates the, the the protein inside the membrane and it also allows for polar things to pass through it's really cool like it's not that cool on a Friday. <laughs> All right, so sometimes they will actually have binding sites so that they can be selective, right? Because remember how we said some are selective and some are not so selective? Well, if you have binding sites, you can, you can interact with certain molecules. So let's say, for example, this ion or small molecule is negatively charged, right? So what are you going to have facing the inside of the protein itself? So what kind of side chain residues are going to be here and here? These are going to be positive side chains. Right? So a lot of times um, what, these, what these transporter proteins will do is that you have a lot of places in the cell where you have a double membrane right, where you have an outer membrane and then you have um, some space in between and they call it different things, right? Um, they call it the periplasm and they also have different names for it if it's in the mitochondria or if it's in the, the um, chloroplast, right? But you'll have a substrate carrier protein that will bring that newly transported ion or whatever it is in order to get it across the next membrane, you're going to actually have to actively transport it because you're constant, you don't, you no longer have a concentration gradient there, right? So you'll have to get it into the periplasmic space, give it to a carrier. The carrier brings it to a transporter protein that's going to require energy in order to move it into the cytosol itself. And we'll talk about some examples of that. So not all porins, not all channels end up being beta barrels. I showed you that as an example, but actually the majority of channels are actually made out of alpha helices, repeating alpha helices. And then the inside of that alpha helix is where your substrates will, will pass through. So the potassium channel is a really cool, a really, really cool channel. So the channel will actually be highly selective for the type of ion that you have. So think about inside of your serum, inside of your extracellular matrix, you have sodium, but you also have potassium, right? And I want to selectively transport potassium. How can I design a transporter that will transport one over the other? What's the difference between the two? Size, ionic size, right? And that's true. There is a difference in ionic size. But what characteristic does that lead to that will allow me to exploit it in a transport mechanism? The size is not that different. It is different. I agree with you. Is it, is it charged? Well, it's not charged, they're both a plus one, right? But because the ion is a different size, you have a different number of water molecules that are required to hydrate the ion. So for example, in potassium, we need eight water molecules in order to fully solvate the, the potassium. In sodium, we need six 
So what's going to happen is that both, both potassium and sodium solvated will enter the channel. But when you do experiments, the only thing that comes out is sodium. Why? When you get to towards the end of the channel, there's what's called the selectivity portion of the channel. And the selectivity portion of the channel has, do you see these are carbonyl oxygens that are coming off, these are side chains that come off of the protein and are inside the channel itself. So if you look at the side chains and you look at these carbonyl oxygens that are coming off of the, the main backbone, what you'll see is that um, you're going to have a particular conformation where eight of these side chains, not side chains, eight of the carbonyl backbone oxygens will interact with the potassium. So a hydrated potassium ion will get to the channel. There are eight water molecules around it. What actually ends up happening is instead of having eight water molecules around it, as that potassium ion moves, it starts interacting with the eight carbonyl oxygens. So it loses the water. So now it is unsolvated and then it gets kicked out. Sodium, on the other hand, requires six. So when sodium gets there, is it going to orient perfectly with those eight carbonyl oxygens? No, you would actually have to force it in. It would actually require more energy in order to get that uh, sodium to fit. So potassium will slide right through, sodium won't. Isn't that really interesting? Like you would never think how solvated something is would allow it to get in and out of a channel or not. Like that's really cool. So many cool things. Watch the videos on transport. Watch the animations. They are awesome. I really like their, their animations on transport. So go and watch those. Okay, so remember we said one of the most common kinds of um, Passive transport molecules are aquaporins. So water can technically pass across the membrane, but not very efficiently. And uh, the guy who discovered these, I believe won the Nobel Prize for this, for his discovery of aquaporins. And aquaporins are really, really highly conserved. So you have 11 different aquaporin genes um, in, in humans. And those 11 all code for one protein that has six transmembrane alpha helices. And so what ends up happening is they actually form a tetramer. So you have inside embedded in the membrane, like if we look down at the membrane, what you would see would basically look like this. So we have four, right? This is a tetramer and each of the tetramers is, is a six alpha helices, six alpha helices, X, E, S, helices. This is another six, C, E, S. Yeah, that's right, C, E, S. I really cannot spell six alpha helices, right? So water can go through the middle of this one, it can go through the middle of this one, it can go through the middle of this one, it can go through the middle of this one. Right? So you understand how that's a tetramer? Yeah. Okay, so a, a homo tetramer or a hetero tetramer would be a homo tetramer, right? A homo tetramer. So these, these are really amazing because each of the individual, we call these subunits. So a tetramer has four subunits, right? Each of these individual subunits can transport, get this, 3 billion water molecules per second, each one. So 3 billion water molecules per second per subunit. Like, that's a lot. <laughs> 
that's a lot. But how important is osmo reg osmoregularity in a cell? Very, very important. Well, that's why we have aqua points. I think that's why it was a Nobel Prize winner, right? Okay. But it's really interesting. It's really interesting. You can transport that mini, but but it's kind of shaped almost like an hourglass. And right in the middle, the water molecules have to go one at a time. It's really cool. It's really cool. Okay. So active, active membrane transport proteins. These are the ones that require that energy to move your molecules across the membrane because we're going up our concentration gradient. So that's what we're gonna do for the rest of this. We're going up our concentration gradient. And we have two classes. We have primary active and we have secondary active. So primary active are always going to um, require that ATP energy. So they're gonna use um, energy conversion conversion, they're going to drive their own activity. So maybe it's going to be ATP hydrolysis. And the other one um, is that it can be, um, well, stick with ATP hydrolysis. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Secondary active is going to be different. Secondary active transport is going to depend on primary active transporters. Right, so primary active transporters are going to going to create an ion gradient. <laughs> then the secondary active transporter is going to take advantage of that and use that gradient to pump something else. So secondary active depends on primary active. Right. So let's let's see what that looks like. All right. So start in the middle. In the middle is our primary active transporter. We have a low concentration down here. We have a high concentration here. So what we want to do is we want to pump our ions across the concentration gradient. In order for that to happen, we have to take advantage of the hydrolysis of ATP, right? So we end up pumping it. Now we have lots of these red molecules on one side of the membrane. So my secondary active transporters are gonna take advantage of that. You can have things, let's do this one first. You can have things that are symporters. So symporters, because these red ones, I have a high concentration here, they'll very easily move to areas of low concentration but they're designed to pick up an additional molecule of something else, this blue, whatever this blue is, and they will transport them together at the same time to the same side of the membrane. So we call this a symporter, right? It goes to the same side. So our red molecules are going down our concentration gradient, whereas the blue molecules are going up the concentration gradient. Did this transport molecule use ATP? No, it relied on the activity of the primary active transporter. That's the difference. So let's look at another example of a secondary active. We have lots of this red molecule, right? But here, what we want are the green molecules to move the opposite direction. So when it picks up one red here, it picks up one green here. And then sometimes they'll rotate, sometimes they'll, they'll do different things based on that binding. And you'll release the green on one side of the membrane and you release the red on the other side of the membrane. But your red is still going down the concentration gradient and your green is still going up the concentration gradient. Yeah? All right. Okay, so let's talk, we're gonna first talk about these, these primary active transporters, then we'll talk about some examples of secondary uh, active transporters. So there are two types of primary active transporters. There are P-type and there are ABC type. So the P-type, the P stands for phosphorylated, right? So we're gonna change their activity using phosphorylation. And then the ABC stands for ATP binding cassette. That's where the A, B, C comes from, ATP binding cassette. 
they both use ATP hydrolysis. And when they hydrolyze ATP, they undergo these massive conformational changes that allow transport of molecules. So let's look at some examples. Um, the sodium potassium ATPase is the, the, the most like characteristic one for the P-type, right? So we're gonna use phosphorylation to change our protein's conformation. And in this case, what we're gonna do is every time our transporter works, we're gonna move three sodium out of the cell at the same time that we move two potassium into the cell. So let's, let's look and see what that looks like. So here, you have to note the difference in the, in the extracellular and the intracellular concentrations of the two ions. So here, for, oh, as I write right over it. So right here, we have five millimolar of our potassium, right? That's extracellular. What do we have cytosolic? 140 millimolar. So where do we have the most potassium? Cytosolic or extracellular? Cytosolic. Cytosolic. So the most is here. Okay. Sodium. Sodium has a concentration of what? 150 millimolar on the outside. What do we have on the inside? 10 millimolar. So where do we have the most? Extracellular. Extracellular. Most. Okay, so what was what did we say happens? Go back one slide. We're gonna do three sodium out for two potassium in. So three sodium out for two potassium in, right? So if we put three sodium out, is that going up the concentration gradient or down? Three sodium out. So here's our sodium. We want to get it out. We're going up the concentration gradient. So up concentration gradient. Okay. How about potassium? Two potassium in. Also up the gradient. So are we going to have to use energy? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So what happens is and this is how we get a difference in membrane potential. Remember how we said you can have a charge on one side of the membrane versus the other? So they can both be positive, but one is more positive, one is less positive, and it gives you that potential difference. So that's what we're talking about there. So every time I pump two positively charged ions in, I pump three out, I'm going to end up with more positive charge where? outside, right, in the extracellular environment. So what happens is that both of these ions will bind on opposite sides of this uh, transport protein. And then after ATP hydrolysis, basically it facilitates movement of them in opposite directions. Okay, and so that's, that's going to allow you to use energy to create that membrane potential difference. Where is this really important? Where's a membrane potential really, really important? In the brain, in all of our nervous tissue, right? Because this is how we propagate that electrical signal throughout one nerve cell, not from nerve cell to nerve cell, that's neurotransmitters, right? But throughout the entire one cell, to get it from one side of the cell to the other side of the cell, you have to create a, a membrane potential difference. Yes? What's, yeah, so it's the contrary, the, the, the cleavage of ATP, right? What you're actually doing is you're driving a huge conformational change in the molecule. So, so that's what actually flips the ions from one side to the other because they're bound to the molecule. The molecule undergoes this massive conformational change and actually moves those ions. So it's the conformational change that was being driven by ATP hydrolysis that actually moved them from one side to the other. Yeah. Okay, so this, this is uh, another one. This is a calcium ATPase, right? So we already talked about how important moving calcium is, and we said that that's dependent on ATP. So in this case, we're going to transport calcium uh, along with hydrogen ions. So if we look, 
start right here at the very beginning, right? So it, it feels like you're starting in the middle of the cycle, but stick with it and we'll come back around. So at step one, ATP is hydrolyzed, right? And this hydrolysis actually phosphorylates a portion of the transport protein. And when that phosphorylation event occurs, there were hydrogen ions that were bound inside of the membrane. And that phosphorylation event releases our two hydrogen ions. And at the same time that those two hydrogen ions are released, they're replaced by two calcium ions. So you have a replacement inside of the, the, the transport molecule. And so, so up here you see, you see where the ATP is bound. So the ATP, when it hydrolyzes, what does it hydro hydrolyze into? ADP and an inorganic phosphate, okay? So in the next step, this ADP is going to disassociate. When that ADP disassociates, it actually changes the conformation of the molecule. It's not always, okay, it's the hydrolysis of ATP that's causing a conformational change. Usually it's once that hydrolysis occurs, now different things are moving, which is changing the conformation of the protein. So when the ADP leaves, now you have an opening of this binding pocket. When this binding pocket opens, calcium can let go and what can come in? hydrogen ions, right? And so basically we replace the two and you can go through multiple, multiple cycles of that happening in order to exchange um, hydrogen ions for calcium ions. So it's just another example of a mechanism on how we can do that. All right, ABC transporters. What does ABC stand for? Cassette, ATP binding cassette. So these are also dependent upon ATP for moving, moving things. And again, we have another huge conformational change. But in this case, this is what I was kind of modeling when I was standing up at the very beginning of class and I was talking about it, right? You have a conformation where you're facing wherever your, your binding substance is, right? And then you hydrolyze ATP and you change the conformation and then you can release it to the other side of the membrane. And this is, this is really cool because this is seen in uh, multiple drug resistance proteins. So this is a lot of times people who have chemotherapy, right? They, um, they develop a resistance to the drugs. And the reason is that the cells are upregulating a multi-drug resistant protein, which will actually pump the chemotherapeutic drugs out of the cell, right? And then the cancer cells survive, which is really, really crazy. So then you have to target the, the ABC transporter for the multi-drug resistance, which is really interesting. Okay, so this is, kind of, this is kind of how we work, right? We have our substrate and we have a lower concentration here. We have a higher concentration here. So we get that substrate to the transporter. It doesn't matter how, sometimes it's a carrier protein, sometimes it's not. And do you see how this one, the opening is already open to the cytosol, right? So the, the the molecule binds and that binding actually changes the conformation of the protein. And it can enter so that it's basically inside the membrane. When that binding occurs, the conformational change of the actual transporter is only one part of it. The other thing is you actually have a conformational change in the ATP binding domain. When the ATP binding domain changes, now it's associated so that you can actually hydrolyze those ATP molecules. You hydrolyze those ATP molecules, we undergo an additional conformational change. So this is now two massive conformational changes, which then allow this molecule to be released into the cytosol. And now you go back to your resting state when you replace the ADP and PI with new ATP. And you can go through this cycle over and over and over again. How far did we get? Oh, almost, almost, 11.40. So the, the book just compares this to um, an airlock on a spaceship. Sort of makes sense, but yeah. So I think that ends our section. We already talked about secondary active. So yeah, that's good. So we're stopping there. So exam stops at 6.3. Y'all on Monday? Go study?
Go study. Study for your exam. Have a good weekend. Go study. All right, we have to do anything. I'm guessing not. Okay.